Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, Canadian scientists are accusing their government of leading a war on science and knowledge. What do they mean by that? We're about to find out. Stay tuned. This is an incredibly vibrant conversation online, our favourite kind, particularly for Malika Blau, our digital producer. <laughs> What are you saying? It makes my job that much more fun. Of course. Well, we're seeing lots online and we, we talked about this, we touched on this issue not too long ago in a lead segment because mm. we saw this hashtag and it was trending out of Canada today at the Toronto event for Stand Up For Science. That's the hashtag and we also saw lots of pictures floating around of uh, protesters in white lab coats. Here's another one, um, protesters standing outside of a university. So of course we want to delve into this conversation but we can't do it without your help. So tweet us your questions and your comments to join in using hashtag AJStream. And if you don't think you can put that idea, that comment in 140 characters on Twitter, well, you can actually get to us via Facebook. You can find us at facebook.com slash AJStream. And there you can find our latest for all of our stories. You can comment, you can even suggest show ideas. If you want to keep up with all our latest news, just click here and like us. Hi, I'm Deborah Barrow from the blog Humans of Amsterdam, and I'm in the spring. Is the Canadian government muzzling its scientists? Across the country, many campaigners are accusing Prime Minister Stephen Harper's Conservative government of what they're calling a war on knowledge and science. They're concerned over the cutting of hundreds of federal research programs and the dismissal of more than 2,000 scientists and researchers over the past five years. The government says it's committed to scientific research and the cuts are just part of a wider deficit-reducing austerity program. But members of the scientific community, they're not buying it. So today, we're looking into this claim and what it could mean for Canadians. To help us do that, we're joined by Chris Turner. He's the author of the book, The War on Science, Muzzled Scientists and Willful Blindness in Stephen Harper's Canada. Katie Gibbs is a biologist and the director of Evidence for Democracy. That's a group advocating for the transparent use of science in public policy and government decision making. And Peter Phillips is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. He's also a former senior policy advisor in Canadian industry and government. It's great to have you all here in the stream. Let's get this conversation started with Chris, though. A war on science? This is your beat, Chris. What do you even mean by that? Uh, well, the war in science is, is the, the sort of catch-all term I'm using uh, to describe a pretty broad-based uh, agenda uh, being waged by, by, by Stephen Harper's government against a whole range of uh, uh, government science. So there's the direct muzzling of scientists, government scientists actually not being allowed to speak publicly, that sort of thing. Uh, but then they're sort of um, also just reducing the government's capacity to do, capacity to do science. Um, you know, closing down labs that gather data, clo closing down environmental monitoring stations and programs, that sort of thing. And then there's also the sort of external battle. Uh, and you see this everything from, you know, uh, university researchers who receive government grants, more and more of them uh, finding that if their, their research isn't industry focused, they can't get funding. Uh, Non-governmental groups that are, are engaged in environmental science and that sort of thing being directly attacked by the government. Uh, nuisance, nuisance audits, that sort of thing. There was specific money in the 2012 budget to to perform audits on environmental NGOs. So so it's really a multifaceted thing, and the war in science is my my sort of catch-all sure. term. Sure, that's a great summary of all of your book. Let's like pull it apart a little bit. Peter, are you seeing this as a, a war on science, or all of these different elements that Chris just mentioned? Is this a coincidence, perhaps? I think one has to be careful to put things into context. Right. Um, I, there's a lot of hyper hyperbole are going on around this. People are talking about, uh, you know, an attack on science writ large. Well, in fact, the, the evidence doesn't support that. There may be parts of government signed infrastructure that are being downgraded, cut, reduced, but overall the federal government is both directly employing more scientists over the last five years and over the last 10 years, right. and they're actually funding a substantial lot more science in the public sector, in universities, in public labs. So we haven't actually had a cut in science. Sure. We've had changes in where science gets done and who does science, but not 
absolute cuts in science. So there's several things going on here, Malika. We're going to unpick them during the next half hour. Yes. Where's the community taking us? Well, I'll start with this. Uh, we just heard Peter say that there has not been a cut, but there's been some changes. So, uh, Katie, I'd like you to have a, a look at this video, uh, this, excuse me, this Facebook comment. Uh, one person writes in, in order to cover up, he says, any scientific research that would expose the Harper's government environmental mismanagement to Canadians and the outside world is the reason uh, for what the protests that we're seeing. I want you to pick up on that word, the, the covering up of research. Do you believe, of course, as a scientist yourself, that your research has been covered up? Well, just going quickly to some of the things Peter said first, um, I haven't seen any evidence that the number of scientists employed by the government has gone up. All of the numbers I've seen suggest that they have declined. Um, as well as the total amount of dollars that the government is putting in towards science. Um, my numbers show that that has been decreased by about 12% in the last five years. Um, with respect to, you know, the muzzling and the covering up, you know, I think that in that case it's true that it's not, it's not really even specific to science. I think this government has um, been very clear that they really like tight messaging control. And so they've really kind of closed up um, across the board in terms of not letting people speak out. And I think science has just kind of, you know, fallen under that net of just not letting anybody speak out. Actually, can I jump in there? Because I think that's a that's a really good point. I think that's at the root of what the debate is about. What is the role of scientists in engaging, scientists paid for and employed by the state in engaging public dialogue? Scientists have had a lot of liberty in the last uh, number of decades to speak publicly on not only what they're doing but what it might mean for public policy. That's a un almost a unique privilege science has had in the public policy space. We don't have economists from the Bank of Canada coming out and saying, well, I disagree with the governor on where the economy is going. We don't have our, our foreign affairs experts saying, I disagree with our interpretation of, of foreign policy in this market. So the, the state has for a whole variety of reasons, none of, some of which I don't entirely agree with, but is within their power. They've said that you are employed by us, you, you serve the state, not the public dialogue. And keep in mind that the, the, we're talking about 7,000 researchers in the federal infrastructure, according to Statistics Canada. That represents less than 5% of the researchers in Canada. So small changes are, are not going to change the, our capacity to have public dialogue about science. It may change who engages and what evidence they bring forward and what, what perceptions they, they bring to the dialogue about uh, where science should right. fit in policy choice. Yeah, I think, I think it is really important to distinguish between whether government scientists can speak about their research and whether they can comment on the policies of the current government. It is really important to distinguish between those two, but you're implying that the cases of muzzling that we've seen have been scientists trying to you know, say they don't like government policies. And that's just not true. In many of the cases of documented muzzling that we've seen in Canada, these are scientists who have had their research published in the best scientific journals and haven't been able to do interviews to talk about the research solely. So, you know, I sort of disagree with that a little bit there, but, you know, it is important to distinguish between those two things. All right, so rather than just talk about the theory of this, I know, Peter, you've got one point of view, Katie, you've got another one. I want to give our audience an example of this. So this is Jeffrey Hutchings. He spoke to us on the stream just in the last day or so. Jeffrey is the uh, from the Department of Biology, Biology and Life Science Centre. He's been doing extensive research into Atlantic cod, and where it's going to, and the Atlantic cod fisheries have been depleted. This is what he said about his research on what happened to it. The biggest Atlantic cod fishery in the world collapsed, and there were questions about why it collapsed, and work that I did with a colleague, scientific research, indicated that cod collapsed because of overfishing, but the DFO, the bureaucracy, the government said it's not overfishing, it's, e it's either because of seals or because of unusually cold water that the cod collapsed. So I found myself undertaking research was, which was entirely contrary to what government spokespersons were saying. And even though my research was published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, uh, this was considered to be insufficient from a departmental perspective. So I witnessed firsthand what can happen when the work of government scientists does not match that of government spokespersons.
Chris, there's so many implications to what Jeffrey there said. I know this, this is just one example, but there are many more, I take it, from some of the things that you've been researching, right? Well, absolutely. And actually, really, if you look at what, what uh, Dr. Hutchings is talking about, about the, the, the cod fishery, in fact, the, the, the government under Stephen Harper kind of took the exact opposite lesson from the obvious one. The obvious lesson there would be that, uh, you know, we need the best possible evidence and the best possible uh, uh, science done and listened to so that we don't see economic and environmental catastrophes like the collapse of the cod, cod fishery in the future. What the uh, this government has done is actually sort of look at those problems and say, well, you know what the problem there is uh, government research labs gathering that data. If we just get rid of some of the, the most problematic of those, it'll be a lot easier to forward our agenda. And so that's really what you see. You look at something like the Experimental Lakes area, which is a, a federal federally funded lab, uh, did absolutely groundbreaking, you know, globally important research on uh, everything from phosphorus and, and the impact of industrial phosphorus on, on waterways uh, to, you know, discovering the causes of acid rain. This is a uh, you know, $2 million line and a tiny little uh, uh, piece of the federal government budget right. eliminated really probably because because it regularly discovers uh, that the full cost of, of uh, industrial expansion, resource uh, extraction, these sorts of things, which this government would rather pursue okay. you know, without, without too much oversight. All right, Chris, that's your take on it. Let's just hear what our online community is saying about this conversation. Well, most people are asking, why is this the case? And Peter, I'd actually like you to have a listen to this video comment from one member of our community. There are two reasons why the Conservative government in Canada has dumped boatloads of very science, historic and vital scientific material. Firstly, they frankly don't believe in science. Many of them are climate change deniers, as evidenced by the fact that even the Prime Minister felt that it was a socialist plot. Secondly, they are slashing government departments to create tax cuts uh, in the next election to bribe the people. These are the two reasons why. So Peter, in that comment, he mentioned climate change, and that's also a sentiment lots of people are tweeting in about that this all has to do with climate change and, and what the government uh, uh, stance on that is. What's your response to that? I mean, I, I think he's, he's absolutely right. The, the debate about the role of science in public policy is very much predicated on, on one's view of where climate change policy fits and where Canada should go. It's a very, very hotly contested area. Um, but there's a that isn't the core or even the the bulk of what happens among the science community inside government. There are scientists working right across all the portfolios of, of government policy. And so there, there's one that there's a hotly contested area and I can't comment on on one being cut, one being being uh, expanded and, and it is possible that there could be something going on there that, that is worthy of interest but it's not the whole science infrastructure that's under attack or even under debate today. It's about a small policy area, I mean, in absolute size terms, of what the government is involved in. So Peter, where is your understanding of where the government want to go or their perspective? I know that you have been a, an industry advisor. You've also advised uh, the administration as well. So where are you getting your information from? You, you sound very, very confident about the direction they're going. We, we did ask them to be part of this program, but they just sent us a statement instead. Uh I teach public policy. We, yeah. we, we encourage our students to use evidence. So the evidence I'm using is from Statistics Canada, from uh, international reports of the quality of science in Canada, from the scale of science. You know, there are five million scientists around the world that we're talking about, and we're talking about a microcosm of a, f of a portion of 7,000. So if we're talking about climate change, there is a huge infrastructure of scientists around the world addressing all kinds of questions. And there may be some discrete, unique questions the Canadians were dealing with, but it's not like research on climate change has all of a sudden come to an abrupt halt because of one program or another being wound down or cut. And so this no, is it's part actually, of what... No, it's actually, to, to jump in, it, it's not that any particular uh, single researcher is the, it, 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 you know, has, has led to a global decline in, in climate change research. It's that specific things that the Canadian government set up for very sound reasons, so that it had the best data and evidence about the state of the climate in Canada, that's what's been defunded. We you know, shut down a research lab that was the only facility that had a, a clear view of the Arctic night, that was gathering data during the long Arctic winter. These, these are not you know, interchangeable pieces. Oh, somebody over in, in, in Europe is going to do that research for us. The reason the government got into this business is the same reason that it gathers weather data, because it's the only organization 
with the capacity to do this kind of constant 247, 365 days a year data gathering and analysis. And, and that's really what's being attacked. So the numbers don't matter. You can say, you know, oh, we're spending more money on science. It matters what kind of science. These questions actually well, do matter to public policy. Yeah. Can I just jump in here really quick as well? You know, I, I also want to contest this, this um, suggestion that it's only, you know, these 7,000 scientists that work for the federal government that have been affected. That's not the case at all. A lot of the changes in funding and the funding cuts are also in the way that the government funds academic researchers. So NSERC is our main body that funds academic science, and there's been huge cuts to two of the major granting agencies there. Um, one of them is the NSERC Discovery Grant that people describe as, literally, they call it the backbone of academic science in Canada, and there's been huge cuts to that as well. So this, this isn't just about the scientists employed by the federal government. It's also all of the academic scientists. Can, well. can I jump in here? Because I, I, I think a global perspective would help us to understand where Canada fits in this larger dialogue. Science is changing. The notion of science being a, 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 a curiosity-led, small-level, individualized activity is, is diminishing, not just in Canada, but globally. So network science is increasingly what all governments, not just the Canadian government, the U.S. government, the European government, the Asian lead agent governments are funding. So we're seeing change coming on at the same time as people are, un, are upset about individual projects and initiatives. And, I, I, and I'm a scientist. I, I'm a social scientist. I, I go to the same granting agencies that we're talking about here. And what I'm finding is that that those who like the old models are very upset and in many cases they're losing their funding because they're unable to adapt to the, the, the need to collaborate with, with people across Canada and around the world. So I, I think it's important that we keep in mind that we're a small part of the world. We're big players. We, we pitch over our weight. We, we produce about 5% of the top, toply cited science around the world, but we only represent a half a percent of the world's population and 2.5% of our scientists. So we're, we're big players. We're big players in some, some critical areas. Right. We are investing well. Okay, Monica. Well, Chris, I, I want to uh, go to you and pick up on something that we mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, we touched on budget cuts. Uh, there is a little bit of pushback online from some of our community members. JJ on Twitter writes in, the war on science using that hashtag that's been seen. The fight is being staged by unions, he said, who've lost union dues and the very workers who lost their jobs. He says this isn't about science. This is about those unions. Well, I mean, the, the, the argument holds essentially no water whatsoever. If you look at, for one thing, the, 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 the public outcry about this, led by uh, uh, you know, scientists like Katie Gibbs and the, and the folks at Evidence for, for Democracy, these are you know, not exclusively uh, government scientists and not scientists who've lost their jobs or necessarily seen their funding. They're they scientists who are alarmed by the general direction of the policy in the country. That's to begin with. Second is that uh, uh, you know, you're not seeing... You know, something like the, the, the handful of scientists who lost their jobs at the experimental eggs area, they are not, I've met with them, I've interviewed them, they're not fighting for this because they desperately want their job back, they're fighting with it for it because the experimental eggs area was doing absolutely world-class, one-of-a-kind research. It was compared by one of the scientists uh, uh, who commented on it as, as, as Canada's equivalent of the Large Hadron Collider. This was an absolutely... A vitally important research lab that was basically tossed aside, not because it was too expensive to fund, but because it was uh, the, the the kind of facility that finds data that is not consistent with government policy. Let me just bring in this comment from the Minister of State for Science and Technology. He sent us this statement, Greg Rickford, as part of this program and this discussion. He says that our government has made a record investments in science. We are working to strengthen partnerships to get more ideas from the lab to the marketplace and increase our wealth of knowledge. Research is vibrant and flourishing right across the country. Katie, you, when you qualified with your PhD, you didn't go into biology, which is what you had planned to do. You went into advocacy. So how would you respond to this idea that science technology is flourishing around Canada right now? Well, I think it's, you know, really interesting the way he says there, you know, really they, where they have invested in science has absolutely been, you know, commercialization and industry partnerships. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what we've seen is that it's been completely at the expense of what I often refer to as public interest science. So the kind of science that you know, monitors our water quality, our air quality, keeps our food safe, makes sure that we have clean water to drink, that we can fish. That kind of science 
you know, the long-term monitoring that ensures those things into the future. That's the kind of science that, that we're losing. And I very much agree with what Chris said. You know, it's not about the jobs being lost. It's about all Canadians need that science. And Peter, you know, you heard Katie say that's what's being lost. That's what we're losing online. People are, are pointing to reports of research also being lost. I'm, I'm pulling up a picture here of, of books um, that were at libraries, books on scientific and aquatic research were being hauled off from the libraries after seven of those were closed. People writing in to us, I think this is terrifying. The closure of the fisheries and oceans libraries shows what value our government places on research. Peter? Uh, I, I've t I've been asked on that on other occasions, and, and you have to keep in mind that there could be some things that are getting lost there. I agree, and I hope they're doing it, it carefully. But libraries around the world are getting rid of paper. My library here has 50% less volumes on the shelf at our university than it did 10 years ago. Every library around the world's like that. We're all going to the internet to get our information. So the real issue is: are we saving the content, not are we getting rid of paper? Paper is not the issue. The issue is the, inf the knowledge and the information that's embodied and embedded in those libraries. So let me, let me make an observation, and that is that the conflating of this as a war on science, actually, if people are really concerned about specific issues that are no longer being dealt with, it's actually, you've actually given people cover not to address your, your concerns. Because there, the evidence doesn't support the argument that science in the federal system or in Canada writ large, is under particular attack. It's better funded, it has more researchers, it has higher, higher citation rates, it's getting better acknowledgement internationally. So we're, we have good science infrastructure. The question is those specific areas. Maybe the Great, the Great Lakes water exercise was a mistake, but if it gets couched in this war uh, uh, rhetoric, it's very easy to get lost because you there aren't there isn't enough focus to get from the general to the specific in the dialogue. So I think in a way this is a this is a bad tactic if you're trying to change public policy and public choice. Katie, well, this is first of all thousands of Canadian scientists uh, who have marched in the streets over this strongly disagree with Peter's characterization that all is generally well in Canadian science. That's first of all. Second of all, to come back to the DFO libraries that were closed down. It has been well publicized that, in fact, very little effort was made to retain most of the most of the stuff that was in those books. They were not properly digitized before being discarded. The Globe and Mail, Canada's you know leading national newspaper, which endorsed the Harper government in the 2011 election, came out with an editorial saying this is being done recklessly without any real thought to the value being lost there. And it's actually consistent with a pattern with this government that they really don't value the science. And the idea that if we if we just asked more nicely to refund the experimental lake area, this government would listen. Go, flies in the face of, of seven years of governing right. where, you know, time and again, this is a government that ignores evidence, ignores expertise, right. decides ahead of time, this is what we're going to do, and if the science gets in the way, we're going to ignore it. All right, Chris, I, I want to give that the last minute of our show to Katie. Katie, you're a young scientist, a young biologist. I'm just wondering, what is it that you want that's different from right now? Why are you out protesting? Well, I want a government that you know, recognizes the value of science, that invests in science, that uses science when they make policy decisions. And I'm not seeing any of those things happening. Um, you know, what? so what I'm working on is trying to get, you know, scientists speaking out about these things and trying to communicate to both the government and the public why science is so important, not just for scientists, but for all Canadians. Do you feel anybody's listening to you, Katie? Oh, absolutely. You know, it. this all really started when we organized a big rally called the Death of Evidence right. in 2012. And then last year we decided to do rallies again and, you know, we tried to have them in a few different cities. And we thought maybe we would have three or four cities. And we ended up having events in 17 cities all across the country. All so, right. you know, this issue does have traction and people do care. This conversation has traction. We'll be taking it to the post show at stream.outazero.com. So Peter, Katie and Chris will be coming with us there. Our final tweet for this part of the program is what, Malika? A tease for the post show and this discussion on whether or not government employees are strictly answerable to the gov government or whether to society at large. So on the next AJ stream, just got time to tell you, Cambodia's deadly factory strikes are demanding more than better wages. So we'll explore whether change is possible in a country ruled by the same man for 29 years. That's another discussion for another day. Until then, we'll see you online. Thanks for watching. Take care.
Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about Canadian scientists' concern with government cutbacks to federal research programs. Our guests today, Chris Turner, author of The War on Science, Katie Gibbs, a biologist and the director of Evidence for Democracy, and Peter Phillips, professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Let's get right back to that conversation. As I'm looking at this debate, I'm feeling that there's a sense of pushback on Stephen Harper's conservative government. Is this just a political debate, do you think, Peter? I mean, I certainly think that's part of it. Yeah. I think it's it's partly politics. It's partly nobody likes their job when it gets changed. And when a group of, of practitioners, scientists in government, no longer can do what they thought was an important part of their job, that, that's annoying. And I, I was in that position as a public servant at one point, and that's why I'm no longer there. I, I didn't like the restrictions on my liberty to speak my mind. So the, 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 the real issue is that this is about change. It's about change in how we do science. It's about change on who speaks for science, on the role of science in public discussion. And, and uh, while I I, I have great sympathy for people in the public service who, who are suffering cuts. I also recognize that, that they're going through the same transitions that university faculty and, and industry uh, scientists have, have gone through over the last decade as well. And that is that their jobs must and probably will change over the next decade or two as the science and the technologies and the problem areas change. So, Kenny, this is part of that argument for austerity, budget cuts, and as, as Peter says, it's happened to a lot of people for a lot of industries, not just in Canada, but around the world. Do you feel that's a, a valid debate? Some people perhaps may be bound to lose their jobs just because of the economy. Yeah, we understand that, you know, budgets have to be balanced, but a lot of times where we've seen the cuts, they really don't make any sense. So, for example, the Experimental Lakes area, the operating budget is only about two million a year, which is quite tiny. And there's a lot of examples where, you know, the government just invested millions of dollars into it a few years prior to cutting it. And, you know, sticking with the ELA example, it also costs millions and millions of dollars to close it down because you have to reclaim all of these different lakes. So it really doesn't make any sense that that cut would be a purely financial decision. So here's the awful position, though. You are in government. You have to make cuts. Which program would you choose? Katie, which program would you choo choose? You said some don't make sense. What would you choose? What would you say? Oh, well, well that, that, that's got way too much money. Or they can afford to lose some of their, their funding. Who would you choose in Canada in the science world? Well, it's a tough decision, but, you know, I've heard that in the UK, they actually really kept science budgets, you know, out of the austerity cut. Um, you know, I'm running an organization now, and when I look at if I had to make cuts to budgets across the board, you know, fundraising would be the last budget that I would cut. And that's kind of how I think of science in terms of government budget. You know, science is so important for, you know, driving technology and our economy that to me it should be one of the last budgets that cut. Chris, you've got a very pointed book title. Can you, can you tell us how your book title once again? It made me smile when I, when I was reading it the first time on the program. Uh, the book's called The War on Science, uh, Muslim Scientists and Willful Blindness in Stephen Harper's Canada. Yeah, I wonder what that's about. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, they, it, I, it, it comes from a, a particular perspective. Are you thinking that what you're doing, what Kate is doing, is going to change anything? Well, I think it, it, it already has begun to change things in that this was a topic and, a, and, and a, a, a policy move that this government did not want to be, you know, trucked out in front of the Canadian public. Most of the cuts we're describing, most of the changes, not, and it wasn't just cuts to budgets. We also saw the rewriting of the Fisheries Act, the rewriting of the Navigable Waters Protection Act, a whole bunch of other environmental protection legislation. This was all done in the context of, a, uh, uh, of an omnibus budget bill in which, uh, uh, you know, the intention was to have all of it voted on in a single vote and no one ever looks at the, the, full, sc the full scope of the problem. What happened was that uh, people deeply concerned about the cuts to science and environmental regulation have pulled this stuff back out and said, hey, are you aware your government did this? And, and uh, I, I think it's you know, incredibly valuable, particularly for a government that has demonstrated over the years that it has no interest in listening inside Parliament or at the committee where, where, where previous governments would have listened to criticism of their, of, of their policy. This is a government that does whatever it wants. Really, the only choice we have right now as Canadians is to make it clear to, 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 to the public what this government's doing and, and the full cost of what it's doing. 
Well, you know, Chris, I, this is something that we, we touched on a little bit during uh, the main show, but our community is bringing up again. They really want to focus on this big business aspect. Taylor on Twitter says, could relationships between big businesses and government be to blame for holes in science research? Another person on Facebook, Jason, writes in the reason why the muzzled scientists, he says, is because they speak out against big business practices, mainly uh, against the oil companies in Alberta and their contribution to climate change. So some of those same themes that we heard earlier, Chris, but is that relationship or the perceived relationship inevitable? Is it, the, the relationship might be inevitable. How government interprets it role, its role in that relationship is variable, though. So obviously, Government is, uh, you know, part of a government's job is to encourage economic growth, to encourage, uh, uh, you know, certain industries to, to, to do things that we deem beneficial. But one of the other roles that we have entrusted to government in Canada for as long as we've had one is uh, oversight of the public sphere. What is the cost of industry doing business? And this is why we, you know, government got in the business of running uh, research labs and monitoring stations and the rest of it. And I don't just think that it's, you know, that, that, that they're worried about, you uh, 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 angering their their uh, business partners, I think that as a government, they firmly believe that um, you know, their message, their policy, is more important than any particular piece of science. Okay. And, and in particular, when it comes to environmental science and climate change, that these things are simply not important in the larger scheme of things when the economy is concerned. And now, you know, many scientists, and, and myself included, would consider that exactly backward. That it's it's the most important thing to, to consider when you're making major policy shifts in industry is what is the long-term impact on the health of the planet. Peter, I heard you pipe up there. What did you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that. One of the, the interesting things about this discussion is it's being treated as if it's, it, it's personified around the conservative government since 2006. The debate about where science fits in public policy is not a new one. This has been going on for hundreds of years. Winston Churchill probably says, said it best. You want scientists, definitely, but you want them on tap, not on top. And that's really part of what's going on here is that some people think science has the answer and that government should just do what scientists say. And governments are saying you have a set of answers, some of which are acceptable, some of which are, are contested, some of which we don't think will work at all. And it's our job as elected politicians and, and our representatives in the democratic system to make the choice. And so that's part of what this battle is about is, is under whose terms and conditions will we make choices about resource development, envi the environment, uh, different new in introduction of new technologies, the way we, uh, the way we live in our ecosystem and in our communities. And, and all of those science inputs are critical to making decisions, but they don't give you the answer. Somebody at yeah. somewhere, somebody somehow has to say, I'm going to interpret all this, in most cases, conflicting science and make some judgment and be accountable for it. Because at the but again, end of the, but again if the data that. is not there, you can't make a judgment. Exactly. exactly. Uh, what I'm saying is that there, there's glo this is a globalized science community, and, and the, the absence of Canadian data does not mean the absence of evidence. It just it, means it the absence per, of it, evidence it, it, created by us. It's the absence of evidence for Canadian environmental problems. Well, if the Department of Fisheries does not have the capacity, and it didn't, to do a proper environmental impact assessment on the Northern Gateway si Pipeline, no one else is going to do that research. That is I, research that is vital in the Canadian public interest. I, I think that's a respective argument. It, the, it hasn't been done yet. So, so I, think, I think we just have to be careful to, to keep in mind that this is, this is a contested space. People are mad about change. People are mad about the current government, and I get that. I'm, I'm not overly happy at times, too. But let's not conflate a problem and make it so it's an impossible one to fix because this is not a war on science this is a this is a debate about the appropriate role of science and what science is compelling in the context of public policy choice katie well that's that's kind of a big one to respond to i'm really confused as to a lot of what peter was saying there i agree with the way he laid that out but we're not saying that scientists should be the ones making the decision we agree with the way that he laid that out, that the science needs to be done and needs to play a part in the policy decisions that are being made. But what we're seeing is not that, you know, they weigh the science and decide to go a different route. We're seeing the actual science be completely disregarded and in many cases not even done anymore. So the science just doesn't even exist in that realm anymore to be weighed and carefully considered. I, let's just, let's just g get down to specifics because I, I, I Let's talk about something that's already happened and is in the public domain. Uh, the, the Canadian government and, and the uh, provincial governments evaluate every industrial development in this country. Those files are massive. They are filled with, with 
massive amounts of scientific data. It may not be the ones that people want to demonstrate their arguments, but one can't say that we're not doing science. I mean, there may be some gaps. I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to admit that this isn't perfect, but it's not like there's an empty file sitting on some regulator's desk and they just flip a coin. They are actually going through internationally approved and recognized protocols for making choices. In some cases, that means there's some things we used to do we don't need anymore. And, and in some cases, that means that there will be change in the scientific infrastructure in the federal system. All right, so this is a conversation uh, that's going to go on for a while You're online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> online amongst our guests and also in Canada. There's something that Peter said that I found very intriguing. He said he was a public servant at some point. He didn't like it. He got out. So let me ask our young scientist, Katie, here. If you work for the government, if you're a federal scientist, what is your role? Is it just science or are you answerable to whatever administration pays you? Well, the only way that you can properly do science is if it is independent. You have to be able to do your science without interference from the government. Um, and I really disagree with this premise that's being set up that, you know, if you are a government scientist, you're not allowed to speak out and that's just the way it is. Because that's not the way it is in the U.S. The U.S. has made big changes in the last few years where they have made it explicit that scientists are allowed to speak out not only about their research, but they are also allowed to comment on public policy. They just have to make clear that they're giving their personal opinion and not speaking on behalf of the government. But they so also have, have, they also have very, very large budget cuts. Just talk to anybody at NASA um, it, and also at the EPA as well. There are, there are lots of budget cuts in the U.S. too. This is a conversation that will run and run. Before Peter takes a breath, I'm going to say thank you, Peter. <laughs> thank you to Katie and thank you to Chris. It's been really enjoyable just seeing a little bit of the debate that you are having in Canada right now. Thank you for being part of the thank conversation. You. Thank you all. So, Malika. The community, are they weighted one way or the other? Are they in favour of scientists or in favour of the Harper Conservative government? I actually think a lot of what I'm seeing is people saying, this is interesting, I learned something I didn't even know. All right, it's good. We have the right guess. Oh, yes, it is. So thank you very much for that. We're moving that conversation online. Meanwhile, on the next show, Cambodia's deadly factory strikes are demanding more than better wages. We'll find out whether the change is actually possible in a country ruled by the same man for 29 years. But until then, we will see you online. Thanks for watching.